Now, slap him by moving your hand quickly from side to side across him. A land of innocence has no need for gods. Until fate intervenes. In 2001, Peter Molyneux released Black and White as the first major release for the studio known as Lionhead Studios, a studio that would go on to gain fame for the Fable franchise. A game of unmatched ambition to this day, and a concept I have not seen redone. Now, let's tear the band-aid off. Now, you, you clicked either because goofy thumbnail, the wacky claim that I consider this my favorite game of all time, the fact that I'm a furry, or because you thought I'd be talking about the Pokemon installment of the same name. But if we're talking about, on a deep level, my favorite game of all time, I mean, we could talk about obsessively replaying, which I was known to do with games like Spyro the Dragon, Ocarina of Time, Gran Turismo, etc. And you could definitely make a case for those as being some of my favorites of all time. And then you have the games that are designed for long-term grinding, to unlock and discover new things, such as the first Roller Coaster Tycoon and the first two Diablo games. But if we're looking deep down into the pit of fully cherishing something and being fully immersed by the world it puts you in on a soul-touching level that delivers both a good payoff while still being astoundingly replayable, there's only one game I can really consider. I think I got them to breed! Why are they all dancing around the floating schoolhouse? Please don't throw me! Oh, somebody died. Let's build a house on them. I literally got them both at the same time, are you kidding me? This is my persona, guys. The shield is ready. That's more than a shield, that's a fucking impenetrable force. Yo. For better or for worse. A game so against the grain at its release that only hipsters of the early 2000s even care enough to talk about it now, and with a name so ungoogleable, you're more likely to come across some edgy race political takes or weird 18 plus websites before actually finding the game. What is this strange little game? What was it about? Why was it so different? Why have most younger folks never heard of it, or why has it kind of been lost to time? And why in the nine hells do I consider it my favorite game of all time? Well, let's dive in. And what, and what black and white doesn't do is say, thou shalt be, thou shalt be good, thou shalt be evil, thou shalt be this character, thou shalt be that character. It allows you to be whichever character you like. Black and White, released in 2001, marketed itself as an open world god game where you can do anything you want at any given time. It's open world in the same way a real-time strategy game or a civilization building game would be, but with a couple of neat twists. While games like Roller Coaster Tycoon had a cheeky fourth wall break here and there, Black and White essentially took that concept of acting as God to literally being a god. The denizens of the land you reside over worship you as a supreme being, and you can either be a good and righteous god, what with providing them with food and building materials, healing the ill, entertaining them by way of your creature, which we will talk about a lot about later. Yes, this game has a fursona, and building homes for them. Or you can be an evil lord of the land, torching villages with fireballs, sending packs of wolves at them, straight up blowing them to smithereens with blast miracles. Feeding them to your cre- Oh, what the fuck? I told you not to eat him! Bad boy, you get time out! Also, your creature can take poops on people, so that's fun too. But that all sounds incredibly sophisticated for 2001, right? Well, it was. This game actually came out as a demo in 2000. Yeah, 2000. The same year The Sims and Diablo 2 came out for PC. And after some research, I found out they managed to create it with a team of less than 20 people. I cannot overstate how much this game pushed hardware at the time, so much so that my first four childhood computers could not run it. The family computer in my living room was the only way I got to experience this game when it released. As you can see, the graphics are pretty dated now and absolutely demand a rework, but note that I'm playing this with like several fan patches that have been made for quality of life purposes. The base game on old hardware was 
Your arrival was foretold. The prophecy has come true. Primitive. But at the same time, an achievement that few others could hope to reach. It's time for Ask Ashley. What it had to have, what black and white had to have, was a compulsive story. But not just any old story, a story, and this was a real ambition of mine, a story which would be unique to you. And this is what represents black and white, the uniqueness to the player himself. All right, y'all, I'm about to dig myself into a hole here with how can you be so attached to something with such basic storytelling and so many bugs? And this will be my answer. Just, just cause. Another creature. Is it true? Are you real? Honestly, I would argue the story element of this game is by far its weakest point, and it's not bad, it's just... He wants to destroy all other gods and their creatures. But not just any old story. The story is clearly not where the developers were focusing their efforts. And because of the game being so advanced at the time, I could argue limitations in hardware being a factor deterring them from overcomplicating the story. It's a simple story of you're a new god born from prayer and you're learning how to be a proper god, then you're thrown into a game of chase trying to find this other god who's butthurt that there's other gods in existence, so you go from land to land to hunt him down and yeah, it's all very predictable. And they gave this god a real creative name too. Y you want to know what they named him? Go ahead, guess. Creature, speak no more. Nemesis. But not just any old story. I just have to think though, do do his own followers know that his name is Nemesis? Do they have a definition for the word Nemesis in their universe? Do they pray to Nemesis? What if Nemesis was a good god, as he sometimes claims in the final level based on your own alignment and how you play the game? Would his name still be Nemesis? Am I overthinking this? Probably. <laughs> There's furries in this game. Please accept this special wolf as a <laughs> Yes, fandom, there are actual anthropomorphic characters in this game, and they dance, just like furries, and they faint from exhaustion, just like furries, and they eat humans, just like furries. <laughs> On second thought, I, I don't know where I don't know where I was going with this. On Land One, you're told all the lore of having a mythical fursona to accompany you and do your bidding, known as your creature. Which is funny, because I am known to many as Creature. This lore is fully explained to you by Sable, who is also named after one of the creatures of all time. Anyways, you do a silly stone quest, which gives you some of your first alignment choices, which we'll address a little bit later. Put the stones on the platform. As Sable says, when the line clearly reads pedestal, in 2001, pray your game doesn't crash on looting the cutscene, and there you have it. The gate opens. At the end of this cutscene, as you soar around the mountain into a misty past, you meet your new potential creatures. A cow, a tiger, and an ape. Uh, oh. Err, uh, shit. Okay, I guess I'll explain. In the vanilla game, you get the ape as your third choice, but let's just say it's incredibly easy to change what animal your creature is without changing their species' unique abilities. So yeah, you, you, all you have to do is just swap around a few files and rename a few files in the, in the game's root directory. It's, it's incredibly easy. Basically, he's an ape wearing a polar bear fursuit. And look how cute he is! Face of an angel. So I got my new little pet now. What a baby. We need to give them a name. You aren't actually prompted in game to give your creature a name, but you do have the choice by going into the player menu to change this. And for a mystical, magical being of such grace as our polar bear here, we must give him only a name worthy of such admiration and adorning. His name will be Giggles. The World Eater! The creature is your first and most effective tool of interacting beyond your area of influence. While you do have free roaming capabilities, you cannot interact with anything outside of the colored barrier. In some cases, you'll see me playing as Aqua since I'm running a modded game, but I did throw in the vanilla red here, for example. You can, of course, expand your barrier by growing your village, or you can do so by making other towns believe in you through impressing them, or destroying them and assigning people to become missionaries to take it over by force. Manifest destiny, motherfucker! The benefit of having the ape, or in my case, the polar bear mesh on the ape's core behaviors is its intelligence and ability to learn miracles and abilities quickly at the cost of combat effectiveness. 
Miracles. We will talk more about Miracles and Creature Combat later, but for demonstrative purposes, if you pick up a Heal Miracle and cast it in front of your creature while your creature is paying attention, it will usually generate a percentage meter above the creature's head for a moment, indicating how much progress they've made in learning that miracle. It does that for the other abilities a creature can learn too, such as taking food from a field or fishing or dancing, stuff like that. Now, let me stress to you, you have to cast the miracle multiple times, and the amount of times depends on the miracle. The more highly valued the miracle, the slower the result. And it's absolutely paramount to teach your creature how to cast, at the very least, wood, food, heal, and rain shower if you want to be at all viable in later levels, referred to as lands, with areas you can't reach, especially in land 4. This can be especially tedious with the tiger or cow or generally any other creature available in the game, as these creatures have a percentage bar that is an absolute slog, even for the most basic miracles. And this is why I always use the ape file and just swap the files out for the skin that I want. Now generally you can't just send your creature into enemy territory because that's just asking for trouble, but you can send them into neutral territory which comes in handy throughout most of the game to gain influence. With one exception. On land 3 your creature is captured by an enemy god named Lethus and you have to, you throw me around, to take over villages through your own influence and through- oh, please don't pick me up! just casting miracles when you have the influence Throw to reach. This week's word comes from Chip Ass. Turns out this annoying little dude here, while none of the dialogue in game indicates it, has an invisible bubble of influence around him, allowing you to reach outside your influence in places where he's at. Something tells me this guy was a last minute add to the game, honestly. But the dialogue you get from throwing him is absolutely hilarious. Oh hell! Ouch! Ouch! My leg! Oh my head! Oh my eye! Inside of the temple, which acts as the equivalent of a gameplay settings menu, there's a room called the Creature Cave. This room gives you stats about your creature, their age, weight, alignment, thoughts they have about you and other creatures, uh, and their miracle and combat stats. And that leads us to another thing that the game left as a bit of an afterthought. Creature combat. It's atrocious. May as well have just let them get in scuffles the sim style without this Tekken style life bar nonsense and click to strike crap. There's a method to it though, and it ultimately does function, but it leaves a lot to be desired. Music kind of slaps though. <laughs> You can throw villagers, you can light them on fire, you can electrocute them, you can drown them, you can literally burn forests with people in them, you can throw poop at them, it is so fun to torture your people, if it wasn't detrimental to your actual gameplay. Here's the catch of good versus evil in the game. If you're evil to your own villages, your influence can't grow, and if your temple has no village left to deflect any damage to, it gets destroyed, and that's the only way to get a game over in black and white. It's actually very hard to game over in black and white, unless it's self-inflicted, with maybe the exception of the beginning of Land 4. But on the other end of the coin, it's significantly easier to take over opposing villages by force. As in lands 3 and 5, you have to work down the last villages from several hundred to maybe even several thousand points of belief. The miracles you cast can stale on the denizens very fast, and with the villages proclaimed true god still casting miracles within its bounds, that belief you earn will only be taken away making the only feasible option killing everyone in the village and then placing missionaries to intercept the empty town. There are generally good and evil options to every side quest in the game. Generally, the evil way to complete a quest would involve killing somebody, presumably the person who assigned you the quest or the subject of the quest, such as the lost brother in Land 1. This is touted from the very beginning of the game, hence the name Black and White, and that is further manifested by these two little guys, essentially your shoulder angel and devil who provides some of the best lines of dialogue in the game. And what a symbol of overwhelming evil! No, it isn't. When you're good or evil in the game, you get subtle graphical and audio differences based on your alignment, such as a shimmer effect on your camera if you're good, or a red tint if you're evil. There's other cool little additions as well, like what your hand looks like, or some alterations to the ambient music.
Likewise, your temple will grow spikes and change to a blood red color if you are evil. Your creature also has an alignment too, and it can differ a little from yours. Ultimately, apart from making people flock to them or flee from them, all it really affects is their appearance, which usually scales from uncanny to just straight up grotesque. What the actual fuck is that? One of the most direct effects you can have on your own alignment is choosing which miracle to cast. Some of the major good miracles you'll encounter are wood, food, rain shower, heal, forest, and flying flock, whereas some of the major bad ones are fireball, lightning, storm, blast, and wolf pack. There are others as well, and a whole list of miracles that directly affect creatures, but this video is running long enough. Anyways, there's a few different ways to encounter miracles. The first you'll experience in gameplay is a miracle bubble which is a miracle that spawns, as it sounds, inside of a bubble that you can pop to cast it once. These can appear on a dispenser as a reward for, your, for a quest, or by hunting for fireflies. The other way to use miracles is through power generated through a long-held tradition of white culture, Force Worship. This mechanic comes about in land two and is taught by an ally god you meet named Kazar, whose sole purpose is exposition and having a turtle that makes terrifying noises. Someone put that poor injured dolphin out of its misery. Your village offers up certain miracles which you can purchase at a certain prayer power cost. You can also generate that prayer power through sacrifice. But as expected, human sacrifice will skew your alignment towards evil. You can access these miracles by selecting them from the worship site or by hand gestures which become absolutely necessary for later in the game. But I know what you're thinking. Yeah, this is all well and good, but does this game have any musical numbers? Oh, we got this notion that we quite like to sell the ocean, so no. In addition to the three sailors who sing you a jolly little shanty about their first world problems, there's a bunch of goofy side quests in the game. In Land 1, there's a sheep herder who tasks you with finding his five string sheep, but... I forgot there was more than five. You can also knock over this rock to get a toy ball. There's the quest where a bunch of people are drowning and for some reason you're not allowed to pick them up yourself so you have to direct the creature to do it. There's a side quest where a redneck wants you to impress him with a giant creature. I've still not been able to figure this one out without killing him. There ain't no How the fuck does he get in that door? There's a side quest where... Sorry, I don't have any special creatures for you. Yeah, that happens. And a ton more. Each world has a ton of them and they usually give some sort of reward, usually by way of a miracle unlock or self-regenerating miracle dispenser, but occasionally you'll get something different. So about Kazar, I swear this voice actor hammed up this performance and it's absolute gold anytime he talks. Devastating. Fire spreads and causes serious damage. Lethus, on the other hand, could crack glass with this nasally delivery. Your ally is dead. I have your creature, and you still dare to oppose me! Kazar is the only instance of an ally god you encounter in this game, which is exactly one more ally than you get throughout the entirety of the sequel. Spoiler alert, at least till the end of the game. Anyways, honestly, one of my favorite building mechanics in any game, the village building aspect of black and white is addictive. It's so fun to get lost in designing and growing your little village into a big town. You can build only a small handful of things ranging from small homes to grain fields to a wonder to increase your miracle power, but the sheer freedom you're given makes for hours of cozy village designing. I did equal amounts of nitpicking and to praising, didn't I? So what gives? Why is this flawed project with high ambitions but meager execution my favorite game of all time? Honestly, it all comes down to two very simple factors. The first and most obvious one is good old nostalgia. I played this when I was like nine, guys. Come on. The second one is a more objective factor. When played as a village builder on Lens 2 through 5, it's absolutely the coziest game you can be immersed in. But by that same token, look at some of these scenes. This is what makes black and white more than just a game to me. Notice there is no HUD, no interface, just you and the land. It's an experience, more so than I can say for any other game at the time. Couple that with childhood nostalgia, the open freedom, and completely bonkers customization in how you design the land you're on, I couldn't help but fall in love with it and replay it all throughout my teen years and even into adulthood. 99 bugs. Oh yeah, we've hardly started. 
Here's a list of bugs, glitches, and errors the game is known for in no particular order. The signpost next to the workshop claims it's a soccer field with six scaffolds. Six scaffolds creates a miracle dispenser. Fan patches have since removed this text, and while one of them did actually enable the soccer field, building it will corrupt your save file. The signposts next to wonders are inaccurate and do not reflect what the wonders power actually does. Your creature cuts into the land if dancing on a hill. Deforestation is really bad if you're on a land too long and don't grow any extra forests for yourself. Influence only seems to apply to you, the player, as other gods are able to reach outside their influence and steal your trees and cast offensive miracles on your creature. Enemy creatures won't faint and respawn at the temple like yours if they reach 100% hunger, tiredness, or damage unless you manage to beat them in combat. The Hermit quest in land 1 requires you to either join a skirmish game and grow your creature to an impressive size before you can complete it, or else depend on the astronomically slim chance of finding an enlarged creature miracle from a firefly. Growing your creature to a large size outside the miracle's effect is not something that can be dictated by anything except time. On my 60 hour playthrough as a kid, my creature only reached just under half the size of the guide from land 1. On land 5 there's a wonder that allegedly changed your creature's alignment to the opposite of you, but it doesn't really work. Your creature continues to be cursed on land 5 after the curse is allegedly lifted. This fucking guy. You can accidentally block your creature in by building in his walk path. But this doesn't spawn in land 3 if you manage to kill him before the vortex he uses to steal your creature closes. This is actually an awesome glitch. You can simply pause unpause to build outside your influence. This is a speedrun strategy. Sorry, I don't have any special creatures for you. Quest assigners and villagers spawn for the purpose of a quest all become vagrant start after the quest is completed. Essentially, they become homeless. Villagers spawned as actor have infinite lifespans while the quest remains incomplete. This! That's more than a shield. That's a fucking impenetrable force. No. You failed to shield the hut. It is destroyed. You rule the drop throwing boss! 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 This area in land 3. If you build a village center near the Indian hut or Celtic abodes, you get a village with a maxed out belief total, a glitched population total, and the inability to worship. And simply tossing a rock gives you another five digits in belief. It means nothing since your village center is maxed out already, but it's still really silly. But building a wonder here would give you a maximum size one based on the belief amount. This glitch isn't even all that bad really, it's actually kind of awesome. In earlier iterations of the game before the patches were introduced, the game would crash on Land 5 for unhandled exception, rendering the game near impossible to complete. After fan patches have improved performance overall, my game only crashed two dozen times or so during the playthrough I did for this video. You can feed your creature ludicrous amounts of food, making them go from twink to daddy in an instant. Looking at the line graphs on the statistics menu will actually cause a statistical anomaly where everything drops to zero while you're in menu. Nobody in game tells you that you have to stroke the creature's belly to make him eat after the sable quest is complete. Bizar dies. There's no way to avoid this outcome. Nemesis! No! You can destroy Nemesis Temple on the last world before battle his creature. He does not die from this. In earlier versions of the game, you can just hover your hand over a structure and click the right mouse button repeatedly to generate a nearly infinite amount of food or wood with a single miracle. In fact, they didn't even really fix this with the water miracle, you just right click every couple of seconds on a newly planted tree and you get a ton of saplings with a single water miracle. Honestly, that food and wood miracle glitch though did make the game a bit easier to manage early on. The end credit sequence ends with 10 minutes of all the people that had any involvement in a quest for you or that you met throughout the game all clapping awkwardly for you, straight up Birdemic style. Then when you regain control, all of them become homeless, vagrant start, and you are trapped in a permanent dusk on sandbox mode, so no villagers will ever be able to work for you because it's eternally sleep time. Thankfully it does seem that fan patches have killed this latter issue. Missionaries and traders are ineffective. Foresters and craftsmen will deforest you insanely fast. Don't make them. A fence, made entirely out of prepared wood, provides you with roughly 50 wood. The game touts this on its load screen tips as some magical discovery. Fully grown shrubs provide more wood than fences. A toy ball makes this sound. I take this life to feed the life of the yeah. many! Was this supposed to be a quest? I must build homes. Your creature cannot so much as enter enemy territory or risk being fried by lightning and chased down by the enemy's creature. State of the art gameplay. We're in harmony.
Black and White had a sequel, aptly called Black and White 2, and Peter Molyneux had no involvement despite it still being a Lionhead game, but this time in collaboration with EA. The graphics were dubbed some of the most groundbreaking at the time, and while they look a little dated now, there's certainly a beauty to the generated landscapes in Skybox. This was right during that time when game studios were starting to add a ton of bloom for added detail to everything while still being limited to polygonal rendering, so it kind of aged itself pretty fast. As for the game, it's great! has a good expansion on the village building mechanic, much more direct input on the creature behaviors and habits, a much needed fast build and multi pickup mechanic, the introduction of roadways, ore mining, and military, but it's not the same. It's good, but I think the introduction of a HUD interface really does break the immersion from the atmosphere. Kicking up memories. Sadly, the rights to black and white has gone the way of the thylacine and been acquired by many dirty, money hungry hands who are likely have not seen a demand to remaster or remake this game concept again and have neglected to release it on digital download for PCs. You can still find full game downloads on third-party websites, but to make it run on a modern machine you need several patches, all of which are usually available alongside the main game. Usually there's pretty decent instructions attached with most of the downloads, and there's also a Discord server for the displaced fans of the series. The reviews for both games were mixed to positive, but it was just too out there of a concept for the gaming universe at this time. I consider Black and White not too odd to catch on, but too ahead of its time. Picture this this beautiful landscape. You have total control over all who live in it. You are their deity. They worship you, and you can be their answer or their demise. Remastered for modern machines in VR. You, you smell what I'm cooking here? Pipe dream, I know, but god damn, that would be fucking cool. But even though the game is abandonware, this isn't the end. Just like with any niche project abandoned by its original owners, a small subset of the passionate enough people are going to take the reins to keep the future alive. Let's talk, first of all, about the patches. The land a little bit. Whoever this was, they actually changed the landscape and added an extra little bit of land here. Many folks in the game's very active Discord server are developing patches, fixes, quality of life functions, custom maps, scenario editors, a functional multiplayer, custom creatures, a full-blown alternate story mode. For real, this game is getting the whole ROM hack treatment, and it's such a marvel to see this game get such a treatment from such a dedicated fan base. One of the patches you see me playing on my main playthrough here is the Black and White Ultimate patch. Um, in addition, I'm also using a retexture patch for some HD retextures, which some of them look great, and others, eh, the grass, eh, a little shiny for my taste, but other than that, um, just a really nice retexture job. And the ultimate patch fixed a lot of quality of life things. I'm also using another one, or trying out another one rather, called um, Overhauling Eden, which absolutely is adds a lot of quality of life stuff to the base game. And then I just discovered this while making this video. This isn't even on my script. I found this last night. Like they straight up remade the game. Like they straight up took the game that already existed and remade it. And I am just beside myself in how thrilled I am to see this game get new content. There's a few successors to Black and White, none in concept, but many in spirit. Fata Deum is often referenced in these discussions, but it's not released in full yet. Spore in some ways can emulate the God Sim aspect, but it's not really the same thing. I've seen From Dust mentioned as well, but I'm not too familiar with that one. But nothing balances open world sandbox, god sim, real time strategy, civ building, and physics puzzle solving quite like black and white. It is set within an amazing, uh, an amazing simulated world, which is the most realistic which I could possibly imagine at the moment, and a world that allows you to do absolutely anything you like in. So, when the official publisher won't release the rights, and no major publisher is developing a copy, what else do you do but look at the grassroots level into the depths of indie publishing fan-created works?
This is what I really want to turn attention to. Ungodly by Robin Hool. Robin, an independent game developer, has been painstakingly working on this project for over three years, with a vision to create a game in the spirit of black and white, complete with voice casting, over 20 different creature models, and has been consistently providing dev updates in her Discord. And from what I can tell, this project is coming to a point where a proof of concept can be shown this year. I cannot overstate how excited I am to see what she has managed to create. So that's why Black and White is my, for better or for worse, favorite game of all time. I hope y'all enjoyed this video, and if you did, please feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Let me know in the comment section what your favorite game is and why it's your favorite game, even if you have to embarrass yourself and talk about a game that nobody likes. And hey, if you're feeling super generous, uh, my Patreon is also linked in the description below. For $1 per video, you get to see all these videos 48 hours in advance. $1 a video, guys. That's nothing. But again, trust me, I don't expect anyone to feel compelled to pay me for these videos. Just putting the option out there if you do. But until next time, bye-bye!